my new setup here. It's not a huge space, but at least it shows much more of my livelihood compared to my previous setting. Alright, I've got some explaining to do regarding this new setup, or rather setting, really. Remember when I did this back at the other place? Well, I'll be damned. Yeah, so it turns out that I damaged the house's support beam doing that, so <clears throat> went the foundation. I tried super gluing it and duct taping it, but it was inevitably no use. Well, I'm still new to the video making business after all, so mistakes will naturally be made. What, what can you do? Good news is that I got a robust insurance settlement out of it that not only puts me in a house that could withstand this sort of damage in the future, but it's also one that's located within Uber Eats range of Shake Shack and multiple sushi restaurants. Makes quarantining 300 times easier, doesn't it? With that said, hiya Toonheads, DBK here, and welcome to another episode of my show. You know, on a show that's dedicated to talking about the history and legacy of the golden age of animation, as much as I love talking about the Looney Tunes, I'd be remiss to not talk about another studio that not only had the same if not greater impact during that era, but have also since taken over the entire world and arguably the entire galaxy. So without further ado, let me ask you... Who's the leader of the club that's made for you and me? M-I-C-K-E-Y-M-O-U-S-E I know you're sick of jokes poking fun at Disney getting too big for its own good, but it's hard to resist the temptation considering that not only have the executives accumulated so much wealth that they cannot dare to sacrifice a small percent of it at a time when people need it more than ever, but even beyond the 2019 marathon of box office successes, we have multiple theme parks, merchandising, major purchases, Disney Plus, and Mickey's Castle of Illusion to testify that this company is one success away from trademarking your soul, and to think that this whole conglomerate was started by a mouse. Well, if you want to get really technical, it all started with Laughogram Studios, and Oswald did predate Mickey, but in terms of what made Disney stand out in the animation industry and eventually as a corporation, yeah, don't underestimate the mouse. Now, I think the timing of this video was impeccable, considering that we are quickly approaching the one-year anniversary of Disney+, Plus, which also happens to be my birthday. With such a massive amount of material on the platform from Frozen to Bonkers and only growing, it begs us to ask this one question. What material related to the Sensational Six is still missing? Spoiler alert, there's still quite a bit. For one, of course, we still need to see more of the original shorts themselves appear on there, since most of what's available at this moment are just the ones used during the Havilah Interprogram segments years back. You know, the segment that not only created a redubbed shortened version of Select Shorts, but also butchered many of their title cards in an attempt to recapture originality, even when it didn't always need to. And one more thing to get off my chest, can Disney Plus allow their original shorts to autoplay instead of forcing us to select a new short every 7 minutes? There's a good reason why compilation shows with these cartoons were a huge hit in their heyday. Speaking of which, you also have the Disney Anthology series during the 50s and 60s containing a select number of original shorts, but were bridged by then newly animated segments or Walt himself that serve as the underlying plot or narrative within, the best example being much of the Ludwig von Drake episodes. Yeah, I know the plausible and possible is available on Disney+, Plus, and the newer segments didn't always bridge the older cartoons. But still, that nowhere near scratches the surface in terms of animated content from these episodes that have yet to resurface. The third example, though, is something a bit more contemporary than what I've just mentioned, but not as contemporary as the Paul Rudish Mickey shorts or Mickey and the Roadster Racers. Did Wabbit start a new trend of renaming their shows during their run? Anyway, what I'm going to be talking about today is technically two shows, but you may as well consider it one show, especially if you grew up watching this on Toon Disney or Disney Cinemagic in some countries. With the success of Mickey's return on the big screen with Mickey's Christmas Carol, Prince and the Pauper, and Runaway Brain, combined with also the massive success of the Disney Afternoon at the same time, the timing felt right for Disney to produce a series of new shorts starring the Sensational Six for its one Saturday morning block on ABC, under the name of Mickey Mouse Works. In fact, they were so set to tackle on this modern-day reboot of the original shorts that they attached a couple of these segments onto Disney movies released in 1998 and 1999, presumably to promote the series. The one I remember was Pluto Gets the Paper and a Spaceship, playing before my favorite Martian. The fact that I don't even remember the main movie probably tells me it was for a good reason. Anyway, the show premiered in May 1, 1999, same exact day as Spongebob in fact, and ran for 25 episodes, with each episode consisting of 2 to 3 6 minute shorts, save for a few 12 minute segments, and in most episodes 1 to 2 very short interstitial segments of varying kinds, 
In a similar manner to the Simpsons couch gag, each episode's intro ends with Donald trying to get starring Donald Duck to cover up the Mickey Mouse works banner. Kind of funny too when you consider that in Finland, where Donald is very popular, Mickey Mouse works was actually renamed to Donald's Factory as per the translation. Sneaky Donald, but you forgot to cover that up in the very first shot as well. Anyway, on to the main segments. Breaking down by character, you have Mickey Mouse, our cheery Yes Guy mascot, who has a sense of mischief restored from his early days rather than being restricted to being just a dull plot device he became in the late 40s and early 50s, but mostly spends his own segments preserving his relationship with Minnie one way or another, while also facing against rivals Mortimer and Pete and others, the latter also playing villain in the interstitial Mickey to the rescue segments where the title character saves Minnie. Then you have Donald Duck, one of my alter egos, I mean our favorite short-tempered duck who although gets himself to a lot of the same situations as in the original shorts, such as with Huey, Dewey, and Louie and some Chippendale and Humphrey the Bear shorts, there is a lot more emphasis this time on this relationship with Daisy, being the theme for many of his segments on here. Oh, and he's a babysitter to a turtle in some shorts. Yeah, we'll get back to that in a bit. He also appears in his own interstitial segment called Donald's Dynamite, where one way or another, he somehow gets a hold of a bomb and has to defuse it. Goofy mostly returns in his how-to shorts, as well as in the interstitial segment Goofy's Extreme Sports, which is essentially a very short version of those sporty's Goofy Sports shorts. Speaking of those three characters, yes, Mickey, Donald, and Goofy co-star again in a separate segment titled Accordingly, mainly running a business of bearing kinds, only for something to go wrong and or some twist that makes things far more difficult for them. Among these segments, you even have a couple where they end up foiling the Phantom Block. Yeah, he's in this too. Pluto has his own segments again, either getting into various situations due to an action set off by Mickey, not unlike the later original shorts, or involving a love interest of sorts, again, like the original shorts. And that Pluto gets the paper segment that I saw in theaters happens to be his interstitial segment in this series, where Mickey sends him to get the paper but ends up being much more complicated than it actually is. Minnie and Daisy finally have their own build short, Shorts, although not very often and not entirely by themselves. All of Daisy's segments involve her being a bother to Minnie, as well as Mickey in one short, while Minnie's segment stands one short where she's trying to get into Daisy's house to no luck, involves Mickey passing Pluto off onto her. Minnie also has her own interstitial segment called Maestro Minnie, where she's conducting a musical piece, but with a twist involving her instruments going wild. Ludwig von Drake makes his animated debut in shorts, who spends his few segments here demonstrating various inventions only for it to go wrong, with this interstitial segment's Von Drake's House of Genius essentially being a shorter version of that. Oh, and the Silly Symphonies return in this series, although not starring one-shot characters like the original, but rather shorts with no dialogue in favor of one of the main characters being accompanied by a musical piece of shorts, kind of like a Fantasia segment, but with a much smaller budget. Lastly, there is another subseries called Mouse Tales, where the Sensational Six plus Scrooge and or Ludwig are in a retelling of a classic story or play, and where you'll find most of the longer 12-minute segments. So now that you have a decent idea of what this series of shorts contains, I think now will be a good time to talk about the original shorts that Mickey Mouse Works is based off of, just to give you context as I get into the pros and cons of this show. Ironically, one of the parts of Disney that gets the least attention nowadays, much more than the Sensational Six themselves, are the original shorts that they originated from. One thing I have noticed over the years, when it comes to talking about animation during the Golden Age, it's inevitable that people would start comparing Disney to the likes of Warner Brothers and MGM. On the one hand, the original Disney shorts do get an unfair and frankly mostly incorrect reputation of being just kid stuff. On the other hand though, even though the Disney shorts were above average for their time still, there's no mincing words when I say that they were not as memorable as MGM and Warner Brothers, at least after the early 1940s. While the simultaneous lasting strain from financial failures of feature films during their initial releases, the 1941 strike and World War II didn't help matters, the reputation of those two aforementioned studios was rapidly rising and eclipsing Disney's popularity, forcing the studio in a position to try and compete with their output naturally, not unlike other Golden Age studios at the time, of course. In the end, this meant for Mickey, since his likeliness was eclipsed by Donald, Goofy, and Pluto, he was more or less reduced to being a traitless straight man for Pluto, Pluto having the most tedious outings out of all the characters on average. Seems a bit harsh of me, but unfortunately, as proven by ongoing competition from said rivals, moviegoers were caring less and less for this type of cartoon. <laughs> 
Not that every original Pluto was exactly like this, but it's a decent representation of how lacking much of the Pluto shorts were. That said, there were still some decent to good ones, like with some of Pluto's very last shorts in his filmography, as well as the Karl Barks written shorts. Also at the same time, Disney experimented with Donald in occasional wacky offbeat shorts that typically would be seen from Warner Brothers and MGM, namely Duck Pimples and Clown of the Jungle. This eventually led them to make Fast Paced Mayhem the standard for Donald's shorts going forward, which in theory sounds great, but in execution, generally became one monotonous attempt after another to capitalize on the Tom and Jerry dynamic, specifically for the shorts released between 1948 and 1952, after Jack King left and Jack Hanna took over for the Donald shorts entirely. Hence, not only their usage of the Donald vs. Small Animal Insect plot again and again, but even getting to the point of severely reducing Donald's dialogue from this... To this. I get that part of Jack Hanna's focus was to put more emphasis on the gags rather than the writing for these shorts, and no one around 1950 could foresee us being able to marathon them at home, let alone on our phones, in turn making us notice the repetition much more compared to the average moviegoer 70 years ago. But they really did push so much to make Donald the next Tom or Elmer Fudd that not only did they barely do anything to deviate from their usual formula and adversaries besides the setting, but it didn't really feel like I was watching Donald much of the time. Just some random suburban guy dealing with some pets like you would not only see with other characters from other studios do at one point or another, but even the average person like you or I. Plus, let's face it, there's significantly more comedic potential putting these small critter adversaries against Pluto and Pete instead. Pluto being a normal dog and having a dog myself, they're known to naturally go batshit around small animals, especially rodents. Under no circumstances are you permitted to- SQUIRREL! Which makes the Pluto vs. Chip and Dale shorts among both characters better outings. While Pete is an actual bad guy who deserves all types of punishments, making his only outing with Chip and Dale another great short for the Chipmunks. Donald, however, is not evil. He's an anthropomorphic duck who gets stuck with all the bad luck, but also happens to be mischievous and short-tempered. Sure, he's bound to run into trouble, but not always one instigated by chipmunks and insects a good chunk of the time, but more often by actual forces of nature. Or at least adversaries who represent the antithesis of Donald's misfortunes, like the Araquan bird, which is why Clown of the Jungle again is a good short as well. In fact, Jack Hanna had some very good Donald shorts early on, including two Donald Goofy pairings, The Eyes Have It, Donald's Day Off, to name a few. I'll even go far and say that his 1948 to 1952 shorts were not bad either, even with some good ones still within, like the nephew shorts, since the triplets' disobedient nature and Donald's temper have always created that funny family dynamic, just that they're not exemplary examples from the golden age of animation. In short, Jack Hanna just got a bit too comfortable with a formula, and only an average one at that. Thankfully though, there was a sense of variety that returned to the Donald shorts from 1952 onward, starting with Trick or Treat, also attributed to Humphrey the Baron an onset of offbeat shorts like 1955's No Hunting and 1954's Donald's Diary, though the latter directed by Jack Kinney. And feeding off that Donald-induced tangent, I haven't even mentioned Goofy's original shorts, but there's not much to elaborate since his outings were the only Disney shorts series that managed to be consistently good during the Golden Age, and in my opinion, only got better with the later Everyman era. One day I quit smoking for. I like smoking. I'm no quitter. Get a lot of pleasure smoking. I love smoking. It's my hobby. I'm... Need I say more? Now, I know talking about the original Disney shorts may seem like a diversion from the main topic of this episode, but it all alludes to this very point. Unlike the Looney Tunes, where looking back as to why they were successful in the first place helped them produce decent or good reboots and beyond, Disney couldn't really do the same thing for Mickey Mouse works. It's a no-brainer that Disney in the 90s, especially on network television, would not want to do a series of shorts that recapture the same slower, yet artistically whimsical spirit of the very early pre-strike shorts. Needless to say, it would not gel very well with the vibe of Disney's One Saturday Morning, and combined with the success of Warner Brothers Silver Age shows during the 90s, it comes as no surprise that Disney decided to re-employ Jack Hanna's Looney Tunes-esque approach, except now applying to all the Disney characters instead of just Donald. And by going to full gear in this direction, strangely enough, 
it actually paid off fairly well for this show. One thing you will notice quickly about the Mickey Mouse work segments is that it's very fast-paced. From the animation, to the dialogue, to the gags that they jam-pack to the brim. Naturally, this show is not perfect by any means as I'll touch upon in a bit, but since everyone involved with the series fully embraced this style, it feels there was a bit more focus on how to implement the new shorts in a fast-paced manner, which resulted in Mickey Mouse works to be actually enjoyable, and in the case of Mickey and Pluto, better than many of the original Disney shorts from the post-strike years. To go over what stands out for me in a positive way, Mickey for one continues to have the innocently flawed persona that I'd argue began returning from Prince of the Pauper onwards, along with a sense of mischief that's explored a bit more deeply here, and you could see this in many segments involving Minnie, such as one where Mickey found Bunny on the ground, spends it on a new bow tie for her, only for the Bunny to actually belong to Minnie after all, forcing him to try and fail to take his gift back to her and get the Bunny back. Mickey in another segment even purse snatched Minnie just so she wouldn't read a mean fax message he thought he accidentally sent to her instead of Mortimer. Speaking of whom, it's around him and Pete where we also see focus on a competitive side that up to the show's debut rarely got explored. Sometimes he even goes full Bugs Bunny. Oh, look fellas, don't start fighting again. And whatever you do, don't use a skillet and a baseball bat. Again, considering the later original shorts Mickey appeared in, this is definitely a step in the right direction, and one that will eventually culminate into the phenomenal Paul Ruddish Mickey shorts much later on. With Pluto, while the format is similar to the original shorts, even down to the writing to an extent, here they go crazy with the concept at times, from Pluto accidentally getting his paws of magic gloves to having to escape an insane dog who is infatuated with him, and because of Pluto's lack of dialogue, these segments are where the fast-paced visual gags and animation style help the most. The bar wasn't really set high for this character in the first place, but needless to say, his shorts and Mickey Mouse works exceeded it easily. As for Donald, while taking cues from the Jack Hanna shorts and going into overdrive with them, there's nowhere near as much of an attempt to capture that Tom and Jerry dynamic with those Donald versus some small animal slash insect short. I got the impression these writers were mostly trying to create stories again that could only be filled by Donald, like trying to figure out how to work a computer so he can email Daisy, and trying to sabotage Huey, Dewey, and Louie's efforts in obtaining the Wilderness Survival Badge because he didn't have one himself. In short, there's a bit more variety in what they work with, but more importantly, it felt like I was watching shorts that were specifically made for Donald to struggle in. So shocking for me to say, but I'd say these average just a bit better than his outings between 1948 and 1952. This ain't a perfect show and obviously doesn't compare to Disney shorts at their absolute best. Relax, we'll get to the cons soon enough. As far as the Goofy segments are concerned, in the 45 to 46 years since his last original short, the writers had a lot of new material to potentially work with for their how-to shorts. From being a spy, to being a rock star, to being groovy, cool, and fly, their words not mine. So just being able to see Goofy in new situations is entertaining as is. I haven't even talked about the Mickey Donald Goofy pairings yet, probably among the best segments here. What we got here is the same dumb guy, angry guy, brainy guy dynamic from the original shorts, and apply that with Mickey Mouse works his fast-paced nature it results in constant catastrophic insanity. From Mickey and Donald competing for a lifetime pass at a theme park, to the trio accidentally ending up in an organ harvester's lab, to accidentally locking themselves in their office, and I dig it quite a lot. This is also as touched upon in passing, where you'll find both of Phantom Blot's appearances. Another thing I didn't mention before, unlike the original shorts, again focusing on the post-mid-40s, where the characters stay in their own series more or less, save for cameos like Crazy Over Daisy and Pluto's Christmas Tree, here in this show, they cross over into each other segments again frequently, not just for quick gags, but having at least a minor part of some episode, like Goofy helping Mickey escape prison, Mickey taking care of Huey, Dewey, and Louie, Goofy haunting Donald and how to haunt your house, and more. I've always liked it when Golden Age cartoons would cross their characters over into other shorts that they otherwise wouldn't be in, even if it's just for quick cameos, so admittedly, this aspect is more of a personal plus for me. Speaking of other characters, it's nice to see Minnie and Daisy to have a more prominent role in these shorts than the original, or in Minnie's case, a return to being prominent after the early to mid-1930s, and for the first time together as well, though they don't stand out much on their own here, even within their own segments, but more on that later. As characters in general though, while Daisy was already established to have that impatient, superficial vibe, Minnie underwent major redevelopment, arguably an initiative dating back to the Totally Minnie TV special back in 1988. To counter the emphasis on Mickey's naively flawed yet mischievous nature in the series, she takes much more of the frustrated girlfriend role than in past portrayals, generally speaking. Whether she scolds him for eating all the nuts or getting too addicted to a pinball game, it does add an interesting dynamic to Mickey and Minnie's relationship. Hiya, Mickey. Are you ready for a date? <laughs> I hope 
You're not just sitting around eating a sandwich. Which becomes a theme for much of Mickey's shorts here, arguably to a fall. Again, just more foreshadowing. As for the other segments, the Mouse Tales, Silly Symphonies, and Interstitial segments, they were a fun diversion from the usual fare this series would bring us, especially since these are among the few segments where it doesn't feel like the characters are restricted setting-wise. Considering the nature of Mickey Mouse works and the fast-paced angle they were aiming for, it does a good enough job in mixing that vibe with the literally colorful nature of these characters. On a technical note, as it is a bait for TV series, the animation quality on average is naturally not going to match the original shorts or even the then recent theatrical shorts. Although it is worth mentioning that a few of these segments were traditionally so animated and one was said to be done in Walt Disney feature animation in Florida, that short being How to Haunt Your House, according to IMDb anyway. Also as a fun fact, Jeep O'Hara finally makes his jump from the comics into his first full animated debut here. Although before this, he did have a cameo along with the Phantom Plot in the Romano Scarpa animated intro to some early 80s Disney TV special in Italy. And then Chief O'Hara had some look-alike appear in the original DuckTales, minus the Irish accent. And the Phantom Blah had his own episode also in the original DuckTales. One more thing to note, in that segment where Donald gets a computer, Computer Dot Don, we get our very first appearance of him, and by extension the classic characters in general, in CGI, not counting FMVs from video games around the time. Predating Mickey Mouse Clubhouse and even Mickey's Fellow Magic at Disney World, we do not talk about Mickey's Twice Upon a Christmas. <laughs> And now I'm gonna elaborate on why this show is not perfect. Starting with... Shelby the fucking turtle and his Karen of a mom, who although don't appear that often, actually appear more than Chip and Dale do in the entire series. Let me make it clear. These characters... Understand? He's only a mom in the waiting pool! ...appeared four times, while Chip and Dale appeared only three times in this whole series. I may not love many of the original Chip and Dale shorts, but I think we can agree that something in the universe is broken. Basically, in these segments, the Mother Turtle for one reason or another pushes Shelby off onto Donald, perfectly representing how horrible of a parent she is. Shelby spends the whole short being an annoying little prick. Good luck not getting the urge to strangle something when you hear this. <laughs> By the end, everything conveniently resolves right when the mother returns, convincing her that Donald was good to him so she could continue using his services and make his life a living hell. The one ended with Daisy taking the money that he made from the babysitting gig to repay his debt to her, only for Shelby to break the game system that he was in debt for in the first place. And then there was another one, where Vicky, Donald, and Goofy all had to ensure Shelby, who from whatever substance got in this universe was smoking, made him baby New Year in this short, is at the Main Street Clock Tower at midnight, or there won't be a New Year. Shelby gets a cold, forcing the three to stand at the tower in diapers to clock in the new year. Yeah, fuck those turtles. Anyway, the Goofy shorts, although enjoyable, can at times get a bit unfocused. For the same instruction documentary style parodies Goofy was best known for, this is the one area in the show where the pacing and gags can get a little too much for comfort. The original Goofy shorts worked better because of how they paced the shorts as if we were watching something informative, but with many hilarious twists that didn't need to be shoved in your face. Okay, I'm willing to make some exceptions. Here though, even compared to other segments of Mickey Mouse works, gags are shot out faster than Gallica ship in rapid fire mode, which can make it very easy to miss something. I even had to go back a few times throughout my watching of these segments to understand what happened. On a related note, sometimes goofy segments can go completely off tangent from their respective titles. To name a couple examples, one being how to wash dishes, which turned into a travelogue where Goofy uses his credit card to pay for everything. Another being how to be a waiter, which was more about how to break it to Hollywood. And yeah, yeah, those shorts did try tying it back to Goofy's original position as dishwasher and waiter respectively, but it still didn't help their titles connect, so to speak. As for Ludwig von Drake, as much as I like the character, it's hard for me to not imagine some inspiration wasn't taken from Dexter's lab around the same time to employ the whole, ooh, genius invents things that go wrong. I'm not sure if Ludwig von Drake was actually this incompetent in the original Disney anthology series, having only seen Adventure in Color and Kids as Kids. But I wouldn't know, because Disney has made seeking out these episodes very, very difficult. Hell, we didn't even get a Walt Disney treasure set dedicated to these episodes, or any of the other animated anthology episodes for that matter. Yeah, I'm not letting go of this. Anywho, kind of cliche at this point, if that aspect of Ludwig was just introduced in Mickey Mouse works. But with the vibe this show was aiming for, it's not unprecedented. 
Now getting into some of the more underlying problems of Mickey Mouse works, even though many of these shorts do well enough as far as pacing and humor is concerned, they still get a bit too comfortable with the tropes that were set up with these characters, leading to many of the segments to feel like they're repeating themselves. This was especially evident for Mickey in his own build segments, since in around half of them, his motivation for action is Minnie, whether it meant climbing a mountain against Pete to name it after Minnie, building a plane for a surprise date, competing with Mortimer for Minnie, or simply working around a screw-up or misunderstanding in general. You can probably see at this point how watching many of these in a row may feel somewhat like deja vu every few minutes. This also reflects on Mickey as a character here. Yes, it's nice to see him do something again besides being a bland straight man, but because they relied on familiar tropes a bit too much, Mickey does not get much of a chance in these shorts to stand on his own as a character, as the Paul Rudder shorts from 2013 onwards would excel at. After all, Mickey's only the mascot of the studio. Why not try and find other relatable aspects of his trademark good-hearted nature to overcome, like trying to keep himself together when watching a horror movie or having trouble saying no to everyone. Sure, both examples involve Minnie to some extent, but like with many of the other Paul Rudder shorts, they're crafted in a way that explore Mickey's character more deeply, while Mickey Mouse works didn't quite tap into Mickey's full potential, even if they were again in the right direction with the show. The same thing could be said for Minnie and Daisy to an extent. As mentioned, even in their own build shorts, Sans the Maestro Mini segments, they don't get to do much beyond in the former's case essentially being Pluto's babysitter, or in the latter's case, bugging the hell out of Minnie one way or another. Though while Daisy does shine more in Donald's shorts, from having hers and Donald's patience tested by having Goofy as a waiter, despite the day originally being meant for Donald to control his temper, and to Daisy trying to convince Donald that luck exists, Minnie and Mickey segments, however, as I alluded to, usually takes on more or less the same type of role, whether as the typical frustrated girlfriend, or as the sole motivation for Mickey to get competitive. In short, there are only so many ways for me to express how glad I am Mickey, Minnie, and Daisy are being utilized properly and more frequently. Just that again, Mickey Mouse works didn't take it far enough. In the end though, kind of like with the Donald shorts around 1950, the Mickey Mouse works segments were obviously more focused on jam-packing these shorts with fast-paced gags. Much more often than not, at least decently executed in my book. But at the cost of essentially relying on tropes that don't do full justice in reintroducing Mickey, Minnie, and Daisy after spending much of the prior 50 years to the show in the backseat, so to speak. Moving on, it feels at times that they took heavily from the original shorts in general, to the extent that one can almost consider several of these segments a rehash, maybe not painfully so, but enough one could notice. More often so with the Donald segments. Hence how we're once again seeing Donald against the likes of his nephews in an antagonistic manner fairly often, as well as with Chippendale and Humphrey the Bear to a lesser extent. Even taking heavy inspiration from specific shorts, like Donald on Nights taking heavy inspiration from 1942's Donald Snow Fight and 1939's The Hockey Champ, or Donald's Grizzly Guest taking heavily from 1955's Barely Asleep, almost as if they were a obliged to create a winter slash ice themed and bear trying to bunk with Donald short respectively as the originals did. Which considering everything I mentioned with Mickey previously, is not unprecedented. But Mickey Mouse Works' strength was more found in its experimentation with the fast paced style that the Sensational Six have never up to that point been subjected to generally speaking. If we wanted to watch the original shorts, we can just buy the DVD. Oh, right. Anyway, as for Pluto, the aspect of rehashing older plotlines over several segments was also evident for him. From saving kittens like Pluto did in 1941's Lend a Paw to Salty the Seal wreaking havoc and Mickey's home, to of course those love triangle plots. But to paraphrase an earlier statement, there wasn't much to work with from his original own shorts, so just making any new changes or new twists did nothing but improve his watchability here. One final aspect to note is how most of these segments seem very restricted to the same setting, which may explain why these characters cross over into each other's segments very often. Though there are a few exceptions like with most of the Goofy shorts, Mouse Tales, Silly Symphonies, most of the interstitial segments, and a few other exceptions, most being fantasy based. But to further explain the restricted setting aspect, the Mickey Donald Goofy segments always show them running a business from this very same building, and in their individual segments, again sans most Goofy shorts, these characters are always seen from the same home, same neighborhood, same city, almost like we're watching, well, a loonier version of the Looney Tunes show. But really, I know this may seem like making a mountain out of an anthill, but for a series that aimed to recapture the spirit of the original shorts, they could have expanded their settings more to prevent monotony. In fact, I'd argue this aspect plays some part of why many of the plots can feel monotonous and rehashed, as the environment these characters reside in don't really allow for a wider variety of storytelling. Consistently giving the character something or somewhere different to work around and or react to goes a very long way, like with Golden Age shorts in general and again with the Paul Rudder Schmicky shorts. Hell, even Wabbit slash New Looney Tunes did better in this regard 
regard. One aspect of the show I didn't elaborate on when I was talking about it was the similar repetitive nature of the writing, but at least there, they had a wider variety of characters and settings to work with, which minimized the repetitive feeling far more in that show compared to Mickey Mouse works, though Wabbit slash New Looney Tunes having 305 minute segments versus Mickey Mouse works 93 6 minute segments give or take did help lessen the feeling as well. So in the end, Mickey Mouse Works was a solid attempt to bring the Sensational Six's likeliness to the modern era, even if it did restrict itself to a fault, especially for a series that was clearly aiming for an insane, fast-paced vibe. The way I see it, what Wabbit slash New Looney Tunes is to Looney Tunes cartoons is what Mickey Mouse Works is to the Paul Rudder Smicky Shorts. The former projects are good projects that manage to steer their respective franchises' likeliness into the right direction, but the latter projects fine-tuned their direction and went into full gear. I know some of the wording may seem like deja vu if you remember my last episode well, but it's really the best way to vocalize my opinion on Mickey Mouse works. With that said, I've got some bad news, good news, and better news. The bad news is that, as I mentioned before, this was a 25 episode series, one that specifically lasted from May 1999 to December 2000, so it was a short-lived series that got cancelled too soon. The good news is that if you're feeling nostalgic for some of these Mickey Mouse work shorts, you can just go onto eBay and look up the Chronological Donald Volume 4, and if you get the DVD set for half of your livelihood, hey, you'll be able to get 10 of the original Mickey Mouse work segments with Donald. The better news, however, is that the Mickey Mouse work shorts will get repackaged to bridge newer animated segments in the much better known House of Mouse. AKA, one of the very few Disney animated shows that stayed on Toon Disney's schedule to the very end when over 90% of the schedule got swallowed up by Jetix. Though like with Mickey Mouse works, House of Mouse was also a one Saturday morning original before moving on to Toon Disney and Disney Channel in late 2002, which of course Mickey Mouse works didn't do itself. But anyway, House of Mouse's synopsis is that Mickey runs the namesake nightclub that everyone in the animated Disneyverse attends, even down to Br'er Rabbit in a few instances. The rest of the Sensational Six are employed in various roles, namely Minnie as the bookkeeper and planner, Daisy as the receptionist, Donald as the greeter, Goofy as the waiter, Pluto as an assistant, we even have Huey, Dewey, and Louie as the club's band, Gus Goose as chef, Max Goof as valet, Horace Horsecaller as the tech engineer for all the lightings and video players, Clarabelle Cow who runs a segment during the show that provides gossips of many Disney characters, which in turn ends up getting her into some problematic situations as some episodes revolve around her gossip growing into something bigger. Still though, as if creating a gossip show about their own guests wasn't strange enough, they also even keep all of their props from their movies in their basement. Not even Dick's Last Resort would hold all of their patrons' livelihood like this. Then you have the penguins from the Mary Poppins animated sequence that also assist Goofy as waiters, as well as the Fantasia booms that are the janitors, and Snow White's magic mirror as the club consultant. Pete owns the building House of Mouse resides in, and he constantly tries to shut down the club, as the contract states that Pete can't do a thing as long as Mickey's able to put on a show. Lastly, you have Mortimer, who's a recurring guest on the show and tries to sabotage the club as well, even one time posing as a restaurant critic, despite it actually being Lumiere. Each episode has a fairly simple narrative. Mike the Mike opens for Mickey, an obligatory joke or reference to one of the guests is made, and then the plot kicks off with what you would expect to see in a show revolving around a nightclub, while also jamming in more references when they get the chance, including staff problems from stopping Pete's attempts to shut down the business, to Donald wanting to upstage Mickey, to Goofy being incompetent. You've also got a few episodes revolving around various guests, some of whom also perform on stage, guests owning all the worldly possessions was enough to get their foot in the door, from trying to keep Hades entertained when he's the only guest after the AC stops working, to repairing Timon and Pumbaa's friendship, to having to deal with King Louie's brother King Larry, then a musical number often enough gets mixed in, and each episode ends with a fictional sponsor, from Dumbo Airlines, to Monstro's Cruise Line, to Donald Duck's babysitting service, which usually fits the theme for that specific episode, respectively Donald wanting to fly, Mickey and Minnie trying to get away for vacation, and Mickey trying to look after Shelby, yes that turn and his Karen mom have an episode here with the same outcome, there is no god. On a related note, the Mickey Mouse work shorts and occasionally the original shorts or clips of them that bridge the newly animated House of Mouse segments also more or less fit the theme of the episode. Like in the episode where Max wants a car, we get shorts and clips related to cars. In the episode where Goofy tries to find love, we get love related shorts. Or the episode where House of Mouse experiences a crime, Mickey foils the phantom plot bridges most of the episode. You get the picture. Now as far as what I like about House of Mouse, to call back my mention of the animated Disney anthology episodes, in a way, House of Mouse is like a 
callback to those episodes, tying an animated narrative around the shorts that are shown at the club, and to their credit, they made it enjoyable. Although the narrative wrapped around the shorts are typically routine, it fits the character of Focus well. Although not frequent, they also make good use of characters outside the Sensational Six on several occasions. It not only plays off the nightclub premise very well, as mentioned by my examples earlier, but also the Sensational Six themselves. From Jafar taking advantage of Donald's jealousy of Mickey for something petty in the end, to even Max having Mickey, Minnie, Donald, and Daisy distract Goofy so he wouldn't embarrass him in front of Roxanne. Yeah, she made an appearance in this show. Even with that said though, the purpose of the show in the end was just to create a new packaging for a bunch of aforementioned decent shorts that otherwise would have been largely overlooked new Looney Tunes style. Which needless to say, it fulfilled. But what made this extra special for many was the fan service. As I mentioned, everyone from the animated Disneyverse, at least as of 2001 theatrically speaking, although TV exclusive Pepper Ann had a cameo in the first episode, makes some sort of appearance in this show, either in the background, quick spoken cameo, an occasional guest star as mentioned. I think it goes without saying that seeing many of our favorite characters under one roof interacting with each other was an extremely exciting draw of this show, especially for fans of Disney animation like myself. But on the other hand, this aspect was also House of Mouse's biggest fault. Those who watched the advertising of this show were likely not expecting House of Mouse to be nothing more than a package show, and that's likely because... There have never been so many Disney stars together in one place. You just never know who'll show up. Because when Mickey, Donald, and Goofy get together, nothing can stop them from having a good time. Pardon me, coming through. Weekday afternoons, get ready to see all your favorite Disney characters like you've never seen them before. Man, I love hanging out at the House of Mouse. It's the only place where all the Disney heroes and villains get together under one roof, and sometimes the results can get pretty wild. Pete's always out to steal Mickey's thunder, Goofy's always goofing up somebody's order, and you never know who the special guest might be. Okay, to be fair, that Disney Channel promo for the show was easily the least misleading to its actual contents. But these promos really did oversell the whole you're going to see all your favorite Disney characters in one place aspect. A decent ratings trap for sure, but especially in the case of the ABC and Toon Disney promos, they were shameless in their efforts to downplay the fact that this show was essentially just repackaged Mickey Mouse work shorts, and again, original shorts sometimes. One second of footage from those shorts was enough to avoid accusations of false advertising, I suppose. But not from me, especially considering that the new segments in an average episode, not counting the movies of course, only take up 7 to 9 minutes, while the other 13 to 15 minutes are just the Mickey Mouse work segments and sometimes original shorts. I am sure some kid or even parent got confused when the show would jump from a nightclub setting to somewhere random for a much larger portion of the episode, so it's quite fitting that my overview on the House of Mouse portion isn't going to be quite as drawn out as the Mickey Mouse works portion. The former again, as a repackaged show in the same way the Bugs Bunny show and animated Disney and Anthology episodes were around six decades back. It's fine, but this isn't the animated equivalent of Endgame that advertising was pushing. While the fast-paced hectic nature was fine in Mickey Mouse works, it wasn't as effective in the newer segments, especially since much of the humor in House of Mouse relies on cramming in as many references as they can. I know it's a weird bit of criticism considering that the draw of this show was bringing in all Disney characters from their respective settings under one roof, and it is nice again to see everyone in one place. But oftentimes, their cameos are either unintelligible or just rehashing lines. To name a few examples, there was a scene where Pete turned around to borrow Robin Hood's arrow and shoot Donald away. Robin Hood was just staring at him smiling the whole time, literally, a term I do not use loosely, just waiting for his cameo to happen. There was even one episode where Gaston randomly appeared multiple times just to say, no one verb like Gaston. No one sings like Gaston. No one has a range like Gaston. No one gets great ideas like Gaston. No one orders decaf like Gaston. I fail to see the humor. No one makes faces in spoons like Gaston. Actually, no one has the opinion of Gaston. No one breaks their leg like Gaston. Sometimes, this show wouldn't even try fitting these cameos around any narrative or dialogue whatsoever. Uh, uh, I didn't get a wink of sleep last night. I slept like a log. It seemed the writing in the House of Mouse segments were tweaked a bit too many times so they could force these references to be CONTACT SENSITIVE when it otherwise wouldn't be, or just had a funny joke in mind that they absolutely needed to shoehorn a cameo for. Maybe I am expecting too much from again, a glorified package show, but it doesn't feel like an authentic crossover, particularly one that this show has really been on selling audiences. And that's okay really, this show did what it meant to do and did it fairly well. 
create a decent to good package show with good narratives and a lot of fan service, even if a lot of the references and cameos felt forced and unnatural a lot of the time, and put it around a bunch of decent to good Mickey Mouse work shorts. What more can I say? Actually, there are a couple more things. There were two Mickey Mouse work segments that did not make it onto House of Mouse. One being Minnie Takes Care of Pluto, the other being the mini segment Pluto Gets the Paper Vending Machine. To be quite frank, I have no idea why the latter did not air. But the former, I assume it had something to do with... While I cannot officially confirm this, all the wiki pages indicate that there were a select number of shorts that didn't originally air when Mickey Mouse Works was running, and were merely just shoved for the House of Mouse later on, including a standalone Humphrey the Bear short and a Three Little Pig short, the latter marking the first appearance of the Big Bad Wolf's son, Lil Bad Wolf. And lastly, as a result of Mickey Mouse Works segments getting repackaged into House of Mouse, those Donald intro gags at the start of each episode have unfortunately been lost to the sands of time, aka YouTube at least in this case. Well, I guess that's all the info that's spilling out of my brain today. Well, folks, hopefully this show or these shows, however you want to see it, will end up on Disney Plus one day so you can see whether or not you agree with my fairly positive opinions on this show. But until that day comes, there's only one way we can turn for this show. You heard me, Timmy! Yo ho, yo ho, a Harris wait for me! Hiya folks, thanks very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, remember to click like below, subscribe and hit that bell so you can be the first to see any new content that I post. You can also follow me on Twitter and my WordPress accounts at the links below, the latter which I use to post any larger than average updates to my videos and or channel. In the meantime, you can view my other Toonland Inquirer episodes on the right hand side. Well, that's all for now folks, see you next time.